Michael has been in the news lately in his dispute with Dan Brown of the Da Vinci Code. I'm not so sure they're going to be talking about that, but what they are going to be talking about is the discoveries that Michael has made in his new book, The Jesus Papers, which has been a bit overshadowed by the controversies in the news, but this is a phenomenal book, and these discoveries are really remarkable. We'll be right back. From Nashville, this is William Henry sitting in for Whitley Strieber. This is Dreamland. Welcome, everyone. Twenty years ago, Michael Bajan and his colleagues stunned the world with a controversial theory that Jesus and Mary Magdalene were married and founded a holy bloodline. His best-selling book, Holy Blood, Holy Grail, with authors Henry Lincoln and Richard Lee, became an international publishing phenomenon and was one of the sources for Dan Brown's novel, The Da Vinci Code. Now, with two additional decades of research behind him, Michael Bajan's The Jesus Papers presents explosive new evidence that challenges everything we know about the life and death of Jesus. Michael Bajan, welcome to Dreamland. Hi, William. Good to be with you. Hey, thank you so much for joining us. I have to get a personal note out of the way, if you don't mind. I was one of those sophomores at a small Southern Baptist college in Nashville in 1982 when Holy Blood, Holy Grail was published. It absolutely changed my life. I mean, I remember I was in a sophomore uh, religion class, and a professor assigned us to review a book whose implications would impact Christianity. And I was uh, fortunate enough to pick up your book, and I wrote a review of it. Unfortunately, the professor flunked me, and he said, hey, are you sure you want to go to a school at a small Southern Baptist school? And, of course, I wasn't sure. And uh, I was certain, though, that, that Holy Blood, Holy Grail had a power pack within it that changed my life. It was like a blast from a supernova, and I'm sure you get the same reaction from millions of others, but I just wanted to begin with a, a heartfelt thank you for all the incredible work that you've done. I think you've got to be one of the bravest people on the planet right now. Well, that's wonderful that you like that. I mean, it changed our life, too. It took, took my life over, sort of grabbed it by the scruff of the neck and kicked it off into the far distance. Um, I, I had no idea where we were going to end up when we started work on that book, and it just we just followed the story, really. And, uh, you know, look where it took us. And, of course, the Messianic Legacy followed soon after, which had some of your reflections on it and got in more into detail on the, one of the subjects we want to talk about today, which is Jesus' connection with the Zealots. But before we do that, I, I, I wanted to note that I think that of all the contributions your books make, the single most powerful concept that I derived is that there are really only two forms of Christianity, the descriptive religion about the dead Jesus, which mass Christianity indoctr indoctrinates people in, and then the pure religion of the living Jesus, which, as you note, can only come from within. So I wondered if we could begin there, Michael, with some of your thoughts on that concept of, of the true, pure religion of the living Jesus. Well, this is the whole point of the book, The Jesus Papers, and, and I'm, I'm profoundly grateful that you've honed into it so quickly. I mean, this is the, the 1,500 years of cover-up that I'm talking about, that in the 4th century they created this theological concept of Jesus. They made him into a god, a pagan god, effectively. And by doing this, they silenced the man underneath. And if you look at the man underneath, you find someone who's, teaching in an extraordinary spiritual system which has no gender distinctions. I mean, it's open to men and women. There's none of this nonsense of a male-dominated apostolic succession. None of that's there. He's not claiming to be God. He's saying that everybody has within them some divinity and that they can discover that for themselves. It's experiential, it's individual, it's mystical, it's initiatory. It has to do with each man and woman uh, approaching, finding, and experiencing divinity for themselves. And by doing this, though he's working in a Jewish tradition, this tradition of this uh, individual and experiential approach to spirituality, this tradition goes right across the ancient world. We find it in Egypt, Greece, Rome. And that's why in my book, I, I go on a two or three chapter excursion taking the reader on a journey through these other systems so that the reader can become familiar with the techniques and the metaphors used to describe it because of course the events, this kind of experience is, is really beyond the capabilities of language to express it. <laughs> 
That's right, and that's one of the things I so appreciated, especially when you took us to Egypt, because you noted that one of the key things that you have to do when you're in the temples is actually feel them and embrace them, yeah. and I thought that, that that was such a key statement. So why don't we talk about that just for a moment, because very often when you see depictions of Jesus and Mary Magdalene, there are these holier-than-thou kind of depictions, and often very solemn, they never show them, and what I would suggest is their native habitat, the temples of Egypt, of Iran and Iraq even, and other places. So let's talk about what that temple experience must have been like. Well, the, the point of the temples, I mean, what's the point of any religion? It's to guide or aid people towards experiencing divinity for themselves. But what so often happens is the religion starts getting more interested in sustaining its own organization. But the temples, the beauty of the temples was, especially in ancient Egypt and uh, you know, many other countries, is that they were there, they existed primarily to serve, to serve what was called Ma'at in Egypt, which is this universal harmony and the idea was that by maintaining a relationship between this world and the next world or which the Egyptians called the Duat the far world which is this world of the spiritual beings this world of divinity by maintaining the constant harmonious relationship between these two worlds our world and that world then the, then the harmony of the universe was maintained and so the whole point of the priesthood of the temples was to maintain this harmony to, to constantly keep these two worlds in conjunction with each other and in balance with each other and of course they had techniques as I explain in the book for moving from one world to the other and coming back again in a sense learning about the world of the dead before they died this was what initiation was all about and this is what I believe Jesus was teaching uh, his message of uh, you know, love, forgiveness and compassion was how one could live within the world but he was also teaching an inner uh, an inner teaching which was how to move to the world to the divine world itself and he called this the kingdom of God and the question I ask in the book is what does he mean when he says or when he terms something moving to the kingdom of God or, or Understanding the kingdom of God, and this is something I'm exploring. And so, what do you think the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God was in their conception? It's his metaphor for this divine world, which is possible to move to if you have the key. It's the same world that the Romans called the Elysian Fields, that uh, the Greeks called Hades, that the Egyptians called the Duat, the far world. It's, it's the world the spiritual world which lies behind the appearances of this world the, the world that we live in the world that we move in and it's the world that after death uh, one moves to it's a, it's, let's just call it the other world it's a, an easy sort of concept I think for people to, to understand and I, I think that we have this innate longing to know and to travel to this other world and I think this longing is very much part of our religious impulse we want to know who we are we want to know why we are here we want we have this longing for this this completion to know both worlds and I think what happens with religions is they stand between a person and their knowledge of the other world and it gives them enormous power and I think that's why a lot of religions don't want people to have the, the freedom of knowing for themselves this divine world but certainly Jesus was involved in that I mean there's this wonderful uh, quote in the New Testament on several several parts of the New Testament where he says to his disciples you know he gives the parables for the people out there the, the public but he comes back and gives the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven to his disciples I mean Matthew 13 is a, a good example of that but clear he has this dual message this dual teaching yeah and one of my favorite statements in response to a question by uh, Mary Magdalene it's in the Pista Sophia and he, he says explicitly do not cease seeking day or night and do not let yourselves relax until you have found all the mysteries of the kingdom of light which will purify you and make you into pure light and lead you into the kingdom of light 
it, it can't Absolutely. get much, yeah. much plainer than that, that that is the whole purpose here. And as you, as you talk in the book, that is probably the reason why Jesus vanished from Palestine during his youth and young adulthood, and it appears went to Egypt, where, as you describe, it appears there was a fully functioning Jewish temple that may It doesn't appear there there. was a fully functioning Jewish temple there. That's no conjecture or hypothesis on my part. That's Mm -hmm. the fact of history. Let's talk about that temple, because this is such a key part of the Jesus story that's omitted in traditional Christianity, his sojourn in time and training in Egypt. So please, tell us about this temple. Well, it was set up uh, around about 170 B.C. What happened was the Syrians invaded Egypt, which at that time was part of the Egyptian Empire uh, under the pharaoh at the time was Ptolemy VII. And the high priest in Jerusalem, who was rather like a viceroy, he uh, was the representative, really, of the pharaoh in uh, Israel. He controlled the financial side of Israel. He controlled the military side of Israel. And, of course, he was the high priest of the temple. And he was of the particular bloodline of those who were destined to serve in the temple. His name was Ananias. And when uh, the armies of Antiochus Epiphanes invaded from Syria, uh, there was quite a battle. The temple got looted. Ananias had to flee into exile with quite a number of his priests. The Syrian king set up a new line of priests to operate the temple, but they weren't of this pure line. The pure line went with Ananias through to Egypt, and Ananias was a friend of Ptolemy VII, and so he asked for an old temple, a ruined temple of Bubastus that he had found in the the, uh, Nile Delta. And Ptolemy gave this to Ananias, and Ananias, rebuilt it as a Jewish temple and it lasted actually for the next 150 or more years it lasted till a later date than the temple in Jerusalem and the interesting thing to me was that this in a sense was the only legitimate Jewish temple because it was the only temple served by priests still of this legitimate line now to sort of put this into some kind of historical context for people It was this invasion by the Syrians that caused the Maccabean revolt. Judas Maccabee was the leader of the faction that utterly opposed this invasion. So when we talk of the Book of Maccabees, for example, we're talking of this political instability which followed the Syrian invasion. But already Ananias had gone to the Delta and had founded another temple there. But this temple seems to have been operating a system that was uh, Zadokite that is it had a line of priests of the line of Zadok but it doesn't seem to have been politically involved as were these particular people in Israel and one of the distinctions I make in the book is that Jesus withdrew from his political involvement and this for me was a major uh, reorientation that I had to do because I'd, I'd always seen Jesus as very committed to the political process in Israel because mm-hmm. Jesus is surrounded by zealots but he broke right. with them and I think that caused a problem Yeah, and one of the other points I wanted to talk with you about too Michael is that we uh, I interviewed Robert Feather who wrote a book called The Secret Initiation of Jesus at Qumran and he talked about that the, the zealots and even the Zadokites themselves had a real problem with the temple high priest and the Essenes seemed to have had a problem with the temple itself and that's why I was so uh, just on the edge of my seat when all of a sudden you're telling us about this temple in Egypt that is modeled or built on the same design as the temple in Jerusalem and I'm wondering wow there's a real problem going on in Jerusalem at that time among these groups there's something bogus about the temple of Solomon and it continues to this day because they've continued to cover up whatever that problem was and don't really seem to want to talk about the existence of a duplicate of this temple in Egypt. So this is a very curious matter. Even scholars, as you say, to this day are trying to sideline this Egyptian temple. They're they're trying to say it wasn't founded by Ananias the high priest, but it was founded by his son. His son was a general in the the, uh, Egyptian army. Why would he found a temple? They're trying to to make it illegitimate, to make it irrelevant. And 
even at the time, the top uh, Jewish, the, the, the leaders of the Jewish community in Alexandria, Philo and his brother, who uh, his brother being the financial controller of Egypt, they looked towards Jerusalem. They ignored this temple in the Delta. So there was some sensitivity both then and now, and one has to ask the question, what were they scared of? What was this, te- this temple teaching that made them want to run away from it? And what's very curious is that if you look at the Jewish experience in Egypt at the time, you find there's a very, very strong mystical strand running through it. You've got uh, descriptions of this group called the Therapeutae, who are both men and women living in retreat near Alexandria, who regarded the entire Old Testament as allegory. They saw them as simply stories which hid a greater truth, a greater truth of this divinity underlying life. And of course, a prime example of this, which I talk about in my book, is the concept of Jacob's Ladder. And the important thing of Jacob's Ladder, that this vision of the dynamic connection between this life and the other life, or this world and the other world, because Jacob described angels toing and froing on the ladder, i.e., there was a coming and a going. There's this dynamic interchange between the two. It's imminent. It's always there. It's always available. And then we had books like the Book of Enoch coming out of Egypt. And the Book of Enoch has a section describing this extraordinary mystical ascent, which is deeply personal, deeply passionate. Uh, you, you just don't get that in the Dead Sea Scrolls or in the political ideology of the zealot movement in Judea and Galilee and that's why I say that Jesus could not have learned his mysticism there I mean there's that wonderful statement by Jesus in Luke where he said when thy eye be single thy whole body is filled with light I mean this is a recognition not only of the innate divinity of everybody but of the the one underlying all existence. It's as mystical a statement as you will find in any tradition in the world. Oh, I totally agree. And when we get back to the living religion of Jesus, or the religion of the living Jesus, uh, we talk yeah. about the elements. We have earth, air, fire, and water. And then the, in the east, they have a fifth element. They call they call this fifth element wood, but it's also known as the quintessence, the life force energy. When we come back yeah. to these stories that Jesus is a carpenter, a woodworker, what kind right. of wood exactly are we talking about? Right. This is William Henry. This is Dreamland. We'll be right back. This yep. is William Henry. This is Dreamland. We're continuing with Mr. Michael Bajan. Michael, just before the break, we were talking about this idea of Jesus as a woodworker and looking into this idea that what if he was a light worker and interested in the secrets of light? What are your thoughts on that possibility? Well, I think that's certainly what he was interested in, and I I hadn't heard that connection of wood with uh, the ground of being or the light that you just made. I think that's very interesting because, of course, uh, the word carpenter uh, in the Bible comes from the Greek word tekton, which derives from a uh, from Platonism, really, which is uh, an architect or creator. So again, we've got a spiritual. Uh, a spiritual meaning which is finding expression through this kind of trade description which uh, is very interesting but I hadn't heard about that that uh, uh, description you gave but I, I find that perfectly plausible and certainly fits what I, I've written right and so now we're developing the picture here's a young man a boy who goes to this let's call it a secret temple in Egypt and maybe yeah. he's learning some of these principles I mean, I don't want to make this analogy necessarily, but it's it's almost like he's like Luke Skywalker in Star Wars learning all about the Force. And when he returns to Palestine, he is a force to be reckoned with. But one of the things I loved about uh, the Jesus Papers in particular is this connection that you make with the zealots. I mean, that's a key piece. Who were these people, and why does it bring such a, a different perspective to this Jesus story? Well, I... I have to sort of backtrack a bit on that. I I wrote with a colleague a book on the Dead Sea Scrolls about 15 years ago, and we did quite a study of the Zealots. Now, the the Zealots were uh, a a pretty large part of the population of Judea and Galilee who hated the Roman domination and who hated particularly uh, 
the fact that the high priests had been appointed by the puppet kings, the Herodian kings. And the Herodian kings, of course, weren't of any Jewish bloodline either. So what the zealots wanted was to get rid of the Romans and to have a high priest and a king of a pure Jewish lineage of the line of David and the line of Aaron. And the zealot movement started around about 6 AD with Judas of Galilee. And the key question they asked was, would you pay the taxes to Rome or not? And if you said you would pay the taxes to Rome, then they saw you as an enemy and may well have executed you. If you said you wouldn't pay it, then you were one of them. You were a supporter of the zealots. And this kind of, this instability, social instability continued because the zealots were a very hardline bunch. And when we look at the Dead Sea Scrolls, we find that they came out of the general zealot movement because within the scrolls we find uh, behind the uh, spiritual ideology of the scrolls, we find this political ideology that's revealed and it's totally focused on getting rid of these foreign invaders. The Katim, they call them in the scrolls. Now, I'd always seen Jesus as being part of the zealot movement, an integral part, because when Jesus was arrested in Gethsemane, he said, uh, why are you arresting me? Do you take me for a zealot? This is in the Greek, uh, the Greek text of the, of the New Testament, which shows that Jesus and the person who wrote the gospel understood the political reality of the time. When Jesus was crucified, which was, we have to remember, a Roman execution, not a Jewish one, he was crucified between two zealots. We had uh, Simon Zelotin, a zealot, as one of the disciples. We had Judas Iscariot. Uh, Iscariot comes from Sicari, which is a, the knife that the zealots would carry and were notorious for assassinating people with. So there's a, a lot of zealots around Jesus. But when Jesus stood up in the temple and was, was handed a denarius and asked, who should this be paid to? Jesus, by saying, render unto Caesar that which is Caesar's, i.e., pay the tax to Rome. By saying that, on the one hand, he's breaking totally with the zealots, so they would have been outraged with him. And he was also supporting Rome by saying, pay the taxes. And why did he say that? Because he said, my kingdom is not of this world which shows the mystical perspective Jesus was coming from. And this, again, would have further outraged the zealots. And the argument I make in the book, and it's uh, just an argument along the way of the journey that the reader goes on through the book, is that this gave Pilate the most extraordinary problem, because Pilate was prefect of Judea. He was effectively there to represent Roman policy. What was Roman policy? They had two main factors. One, keep the peace in Judea. Two, make sure the taxes go back to Rome. So, on the one hand, Jesus standing up and breaking with the zealots was an open invitation to social conflict. Obviously, the zealots would be want baying for his blood. But by Jesus saying, pay the taxes, he was supporting Roman policy. There is no way, as a historian, that I can see that Pilate could have allowed Jesus to be executed. He had to make sure that he survived the crucifixion. He had to square the circle. He had to make it look like Jesus was killed, but he had to make sure he survived. And if you, you then ask the question, how would it be possible to survive, an execu uh, survive a crucifixion? Because it was a terrible execution. You have to reduce the trauma, get him off the cross fast, minister him to him medically as quickly as possible. We find those three things are actually detailed in the Gospels. And what's very interesting is that when Jesus was put into the tomb very quickly, after the beginning of Passover, Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus went to the tomb with medicinal spices, spices, not embalming spices, but spices to stop uh, blood flow and so on. They went and ministered to him. Now, if he'd been dead, they wouldn't have touched a dead body after Passover because they would have been rendered ritually unclean. So even that in the Gospels is a little hint that Jesus had survived the crucifixion. Very interesting. And, you know, on this idea that Pilate might have had some secret respect for Jesus, there's a, a notation that Dr. Jean Houston makes in her book, God Seed the Journey of Christ, 
in it, she talks about Christos or Christos as to you, and noting that it means uh, the great silly or blessed one, which is yeah. also a, a druid term of respect. And she says that in one of the apocryphal traditions, Pilate is supposed to have said to Jesus upon the pillar or the cross, Ein Christos, you are the great silly. And she thinks that this is a derogatory statement, but when we understand that, that the term silly was a term meaning blessed one by the Druids, it kind of hints the possibility that, that Pilate had some secret respect for Jesus. What do you think? Well, it's possible. I mean, it, it, that's all I could say to that. I mean, Pilate was a thoroughly nasty piece of work. We have to take that on board. Um, and whether he, what he knew about Jesus um, I don't really know, but I, I, I think even just from his point of view, however cynically he may have been thinking about it, he must have colluded on helping Jesus survive that crucifixion. Whether he had a secret respect for him or not, I, I, I have no idea. Uh, I, there's just not evidence that I know of that could lead me to take that step. Whether he had a secret respect for anybody um, is a moot point. I mean, if we read about Pilate from other uh, documents, we find that he really is a nasty piece of work. Mm -hmm. Michael, if you don't mind, I'd like to ask you another question about uh, yeah. the, the, this otherworldly aspect of the crucifixion. Uh, one of my favorite stories comes from the book of Numbers when uh, Joshua and Caleb, two spies, two thieves, go into Canaan and steal an oversized cluster of grapes from the sons of Anak who are connected with the sons of God. And they return to Moses with this cluster of grapes, and then afterward it disappears. It's not mentioned in the Bible ever again, but seemingly they have stolen something very profound from the sons of the gods. Later, at the cathedral in Sion, Switzerland, we see the two thieves crucified alongside of Jesus, who would be zealots. They are carrying this very same cluster of grapes and bring it to the crucifixion. What are your thoughts on that, this possibility that the zealots were, in fact, preservers of the, the ancient past? I'm going to give you a moment to think about that. We have to take a quick break. And perhaps we can talk about that when we continue. This is William Henry. This is Dreamland. We'll be right back. This is William Henry. This is Dreamland. We're continuing with Mr. Michael Bajan. And Michael, as I noted before the break, we're talking about the, wondering if the zealots were preserving ancient spiritual disciplines from the past, if they connected themselves with the past, and why at the Cathedral at Sion they would portray the, the two zealot thieves carrying this cluster of grapes, which seems to symbolize some kind of otherworldly substance to the crucifixion. That's a... Uh I mean, all I can say is that's a very intriguing thought, uh, because of course, grapes too, the whole idea of uh, viticulture has this idea of the grafting of bloodlines, the merging of bloodlines, and certainly with the birth of Jesus, we had this merging of bloodlines, because we, he was of the bloodline of the high priests, and he was also of the bloodline of kings, and so one is drawn inevitably to the conclusion that his birth came as a result of dynastic marriage, dynastic alliances. The zealots must have known much about this. What we don't know is why the zealots were so focused upon the politics to the exclusion of the mystical. And this is why the temple in Egypt is so important, because it seems to have retained the ancient traditions without getting tangled in the, into the contemporary politics. Because I think for anyone around about 30 AD or 40 AD who looked at the political situation, they would have seen that there's no conceivable way that the Jewish nation could beat the Roman Empire. Mm -hmm. There had to be some way, some other way of uh, sorting this position out. And I, I think that Jesus' message of forgiveness and compassion was not only a wonderful message as true today as it was then, but it's also probably the only practical way of maintaining harmony in what was a, a very, very torn society at the time. But unfortunately, the hardline zealots 
insisted eventually on creating a revolt, creating a war. And one can understand why they did it, but it ended up with the destruction of their their world, really. I, I don't this this idea of the grapes. Uh, my my feeling would be that any secrets of this type would be found in the hands of those at the temple in Egypt or in the Therapeutai, because it was the zealots in Israel tended to take things quite literally. Whereas the Therapeutai saw the whole Old Testament as a metaphor symbolizing something far bigger, something far deeper, something more profound. But of course we don't have any of their original writings, so we can't we can't really draw any conclusions. We only know their motives. Yeah, and on this idea of let's just continue and say, okay, let's say this yeah. These grapes did symbolize some kind of an otherworldly substance. It brings me to yeah. something you describe in the Jesus papers as the, the two letters written to the Jewish court, the Sanhedrin, by a yeah. writer who called himself the Messiah. Tell us about these letters and their significance. Well, these are two papyrus letters. I, I heard about them sort of on the grapevine, <laughs> so to speak, <laughs> and I, I eventually managed to contact the fellow who had them. And he was re- deeply worried about them. I mean, he didn't want to show anyone. He didn't want to talk about them. He had them kept them locked away in a, a large vault, not not in his home. And after some months, he came to trust me enough to take me uh, to where they were and show them to me. But of course, I held them. But I could I could see I've had enough dealings with ancient manuscripts to know that they. They were certainly old, they were on papyrus, they were written in Aramaic or Hebrew. In fact, it was Aramaic, but I find it very difficult to tell the difference between the two. But it was extraordinarily frustrating for me, because I I can't read them, and I wanted to take them to a good scholar, but he wouldn't let me take them away, he wouldn't let me photograph them. What he told me they said is that they were a letter from Bani Mashiach, which means the Messiah of the children of Israel, to the Sanhedrin and he's obviously been accused of claiming that he's God and what he's doing he's writing back saying no you've got it all wrong I'm not claiming I'm God I'm claiming that I'm filled with the spirit of God now there's three possibilities with these two fragments one is that they are what they say they are that they are a direct letter written by the Messiah to the Sanhedrin or they could be a report by the Sanhedrin of that particular incident reporting that the Messiah wrote back to the Sanhedrin or they could be an early version of what later became John's Gospel because I I was struck at the time by the similarity between this incident and the incident in uh, John 10, 33-35 where Jesus is accused of being God and he he replies that everyone who listens to the word of God are themselves God he, he quotes from Psalm 82 and it seems to me that this is the same incident reported in a slightly different manner so until I can get hold of these documents and give them to a, a good scholar to do a, a, a full translation and a full analysis of the context then we can't know for certain uh, what they are, but I have to say they pull the plug entirely on this Vatican spin, this fourth century overview that was placed on Jesus, because this brings us right back to the historical Jesus, the man who never claimed to be God, who never claimed he was starting a religion, but who wanted everyone to discover their own innate divinity for themselves. He was a man who showed people the way, who took them there, and he called right. this and by saying, the kingdom of heaven. And by saying that he's filled with the Spirit of God, it suggests that he might have known a technique whereby the average individual could also do so. And this Absolutely. brings me to, this brings me to my, my next question, which is, where does Mary Magdalene fill in this picture here? Because she seems to have played a key role in filling him with that spirit, certainly anointing him, and must have, in my view, from the research I've looked at anyway, must have had a, a real understanding of his true message. So where's Mary Magdalene? I, I, think, I think that's right. I think that's absolutely right. I mean, 
at the end of the second century, or during the course of the second century, women were fulfilling a role in the Christian church uh, equal to those of the men. It was the end of the second century that people like Tertullian and Irenaeus, who clearly hated women, uh, began to push a strain of Christianity which excluded women effectively, and this was the strain which became the orthodox strain, and so we ended up we end up with this nonsense now where uh, people even question whether women can be priests or bishops or even pope. I mean, it's, it's so stupid, it's hardly even worth arguing about, except right. that an enormous number of people still adhere to this line. Now, it's quite clear, again, nothing was written down about Jesus until the second century AD. There's nothing we can hold in our hand that dates from the first century AD that has anything to do with the Gospels. It's, it's the second century that they appear. And if we look at the second century, we get a very wide range of documents that are written. Christianity was obviously a very rich and very diverse tradition at that stage. And among the documents, we have quite a number which show that Jesus had a very easy relationship with the women among his followers. Some of this, of course, has ended up in the New Testament. I mean, we think of the easy chat which Jesus had with the woman by the well, for example, or we find that uh, the wife of Herod's steward, for example, his prime minister, was among Jesus' followers. But we also have this very close relationship between Jesus and Mary Magdalene appearing. And if, for example, they hadn't been married, then that close relationship would have been scandalous in the context of the times. We also have a gospel of Mary Magdalene herself. And in this gospel, it makes it plain that Mary understood Jesus' mystical message and understood better, perhaps, than most of the other disciples. The gospel depicts the other disciples, or some of them at least, being angered over the fact that Mary had receiving the privilege of secret information from Jesus. And I think this is simply describing a reality. Mary was integrally involved with the, the teaching. Precisely what her role was, we don't know, but the fact that... Uh, I think she was the same person as Mary of Bethany. And Mary of Bethany is the one who anointed Jesus. I would argue this anointing is him being anointed Messiah. So there's something very interesting and profound going on there which has been completely lost from the Christian tradition. It's hard to figure out precisely what it is, but we're left with the fact that Jesus was anointed Messiah by a woman who was probably his wife. Now that's a very interesting situation. This is William Henry. This is Dreamland. We'll be right back. This is William Henry. This is Dreamland. We're continuing with Michael Bajan. Michael, just before the break, we were had been talking about Mary Magdalene and the possibility that they were married. And there's a very good researchers that make the claim that Mary Magdalene herself was trained in the temples of Egypt. Have you found any evidence to support that notion? I haven't found any evidence to support either Mary or Jesus being trained in the temple in Egypt. It's just that we have to ask the question, where did he discover his mystical teaching? He wouldn't have discovered it in Judea and Galilee, in the only place that it was part of the Jewish teaching is in Egypt and so uh, by that argument he had to have learned it in Egypt but it's conjecture on my part but it's very plausible conjecture but because of that there's no proof whatsoever unfortunately which is not to say that something might come out of the uh, clandestine antiquities network in due course because documents are out there real treasures are out there and stuff is popping out all the time so I think it's, we're living in exciting times because much more material is appearing and what's also very good is that a, a lot of good scholars have now gained the courage really to ask some quite radical questions I mean I'm, I'm reminded just recently with the Gospel of Judas that appeared mm -hmm. the scholars who were involved with that are really asking tough questions of Christianity as a result and are really investigating 
from from very arcane areas, and I think this is good because now that the scholars are no longer frightened of losing their university seats, they are going to start embracing a few more alternative ideas and they will find more material, I'm sure. So we're in very, very exciting times and I'm very hopeful that a lot of this material, especially the mystical side of Jesus, will become more and more to the fore. Oh, I agree. I mean, it's about time for the crack in the cosmic egg. And before we go on, though, I wanted to ask you one more question about Egypt here. I've always been intrigued by some of the earliest examples of art used for Christian purposes, and those are those that are found in the catacombs of Rome, and most of them dated around 150 to 250 A.D., and in these depictions, Jesus is portrayed short-haired, clean-shaven, and performing his miracles with what is we might describe as a magic wand. These, these depictions, especially when Jesus is portrayed raising Lazarus, precisely match Thoth or Tahuti in Egypt raising Osiris. Have you looked into the connection between this relationship of Thoth raising Osiris and Jesus and the raising of Lazarus? Well, I, I, I certainly think that the, the raising of Lazarus is a, a sort of a garbled version of one of Jesus' initiations, put it that way. Uh, and certainly in ancient Egypt, the priests used these wands. They had a whole different range of wands. If you go into the temples and look at the chapels where, especially the Osiris chapels, uh, especially at the Temple of Seti the First at Abydos, there's some beautiful Beautifully uh, colored uh, uh, depictions of this. Uh, you can see that there's all kinds of different wands depending on which part of the ritual they're involved in. Now, the Osiris raising ritual or the bringing of the king to the state of Osiris uh, is one thing, but I think what we can also understand is more people other than the king himself also went through the ceremony, also had this ritual. And the Egyptians certainly uh, were involved in rituals taking people, uh, presumably other priests. I don't know how far this moved into the public arena, but at least other priests across to this other world. They allowed them to have this experience. And there's these underground crypts in many of the temples, and uh, many of which I've been into, where it's my uh, belief that this is where the ceremonies w- took place, because we have certain certain writers have mentioned these secret rooms where, by candlelight, these rituals are are uh, conducted. There's little tidbits of information because this this material was all very secret. We have to understand people weren't allowed to talk about it, and so we. We just have snippets emerging here and there in particular writings, and I've brought a few of these snippets together in the book so that we right. can see how it progresses. And speaking of initiation and tunnels, I was on the edge of my seat reading your chapter, chapter 10 called Initiation, about going into the tunnels at Baia in northern Italy. Oh, uh, Baia is the most amazing place I've ever been, <laughs> and of course, you know, it's my friend Robert Temple who's mm-hmm. just had a book published, I think, in the States, uh, which spends a lot of time describing uh, his work with Bayer. It's just uh, uh, a truly amazing place, and just I, I, I absolutely want to excavate it because it's filled with rubble. The, the underground temple was all sealed up after having been filled with rubble, and I think they would have just smashed all the objects up inside it and put the rubble on top because if they were so scared of this place, which they clearly were, they wouldn't have wanted to take those objects out because they would have perhaps been too superstitious to have them with them. So I think underneath all the rubble, there's going to be everything there. That's my hope. And And hopefully Robert and I will get the chance. And you were the first person in, what, over 1,500 years to enter some of the deepest parts of this tunnel system? Uh, Well, actually, I think I was the second. Uh, I think one one other person, uh, well, I don't know, because I found some things there which the person who first found it in the early 60s uh, and is now dead, and the, the Italian government sealed this underground complex up, and it wasn't until 20 or 30 years later that Robert Temple got permission to reopen it. And Robert and I went in again for the first time. I crawled along these little tunnels which had about 18 inches between the top of the rubble and the top of the tunnel, 
and I found a few things down there which hadn't been reported before, so it's quite possible that the the two people who first discovered it didn't go down those tunnels, or at least didn't get to the end of them. Uh, but, you know, we're, even even if they did, Robert and I were still probably among the first half dozen in 2,000 years to get down into those. They're wow, truly that extraordinary. Is, uh, absolutely. It's, a, one, say, it's I mean, a wonderful thing to be going hundreds of feet down this narrow tunnel deep into a cliff face and then to find an underground river and an underground temple and tunnels leading off in all kinds of directions, some of them filled with rubble and so we don't know where they go. And there's obviously other tunnels there that we could find because there must be other entrances and exits to this place. It's, a, it's totally enigmatic. And the main tunnel runs absolutely east-west it's a feat of engineering, to say the least. Right, and we actually uh, we interviewed Robert Temple He'll, uh, on his book Oracle of the Dead. We highly recommend it. I yeah. mean, truly an astounding work. Uh, and I was uh, I wasn't aware of your friendship before that, but now I have a new admiration for it. And I think it's just absolutely wonderful the way you uh, the two of you collaborated on this project. It's uh, I mean Robert's been a, a good friend of mine for some years, and uh, you know we have a uh, a lot of dialogue on these subjects. It's, uh, and you know, I, I'd, I'd love to recommend his book. I, I can't recommend his book highly enough. It's, it's, it's brilliant. Absolutely. As are all his books, I have to say. Oh, truly phenomenal intellect. I mean, we're so fortunate to, to have him as writing and us as well as you. And on that subject, I mean, you're probably still looking for a breather from all of the recent publicity and all of that. And once again, we truly appreciate you taking time to talk with us. What what might be next for Michael Bajan? Well, I'm off. Uh, I've got a massive research which I'm trying to structure and find a way through and uh, and allow me to know where I need to continue my research. I'm working on a new book which hopefully will be out next year but I, I've with all this distraction of the court case against the Da Vinci Code I've sort of lost about six months as a result of that and I'm just now getting back into my own writing rhythm again so hopefully it won't be too long before I'm back on track and uh, working on a new book but, uh, by the way yeah, one of my favorites was the elixir and the stone maybe you'll go back into some of those areas again oh uh, you know I'm really glad to hear you say that. that that book is one of my favorites as well absolutely